Hello everybody and welcome back. Now we're into another section, but still in module nine. I said at the start of this module that it's probably gonna be one of the longer ones in this workbook because it really goes through, well, a number of different topics, but it also really goes through the foundation of hypothesis testing, much of which is going to follow us throughout this entire workbook. So yes, it's a little bit longer. We've got a few different types of little tests and different types of analysis that we're doing. But so much of what we talk about in this module, formulating the test, type one error, type two error, all the rejection rules that we've gone through, all of this is going to carry throughout this entire workbook. So it is a little bit long, yes, but all it means is that the next sections Hopefully, they'll be a little bit shorter. So now we're looking at something a little bit different. Now we're looking at not a population mean, but a population proportion. And once more, we'll look at a one-tail test, and we'll also have two-tail tests as well. So once again, we need to be able to identify what kind of test we're doing without being told what kind of test we're doing. So let's go through the, the question here and, and see if we can figure it out on our own without having it told to us. So here we're looking at election years. There's always elections going on uh, somewhere. And so there's always lots of statistics that are being reported. You read about them in all kinds of various media uh, about who's winning in the latest polls. One pollster argued that the conservative candidate has support from more than half of the registered voters. After digging a little deeper, you find more details on the pollster's findings and a footnote at the bottom of the page, probably hidden in very small little print down there, you see that out of a sample of 175 registered voters, 95% of them which translates to 54.29. That would just be 95 out of 175. 54.29% stated that they support the conservative candidate. Okay, so the first question that I, I often find when we go through proportions is, how do I know if I'm looking at a proportion or just an average percentage, right? Because here I can see, well, this is a percentage. So why is this any different from one of the earlier, earlier exercises that we just did, problem 9.3D? We did a test on a, a, a percentage, and that was an average. That was a, a, a test on a single population mean. So why is this one a proportion? Well, the previous one, if you go back and you look at problem 93, uh, 93D, it was an average grade that was given. We had an average grade of 73%. And this is an average because our sample consisted of a whole bunch of other individual students' grades. So some students, you know, maybe 68, maybe 53, maybe 76, maybe... 81, so on and so forth. And I don't know, those probably don't give us an average of 73, but those were all the individual data points that then when we obtained that average, it gave us 73%. So that was a single population test on an average. When we're looking at a proportion, you're looking at something that's a, a little more binomial. It's a little more yes or no, black or white. And so here we're looking at I have 175 registered voters. How many of them said, yes, I support that candidate? So it's one percentage, the percentage of people who supported, in this case, supported that candidate. It's how many out of some sample size. So it's, it's, it's the, 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 the value that we're working with is a ratio. It is a percentage out of that total sample size. As opposed to this one, here we were looking at an average of all of those other individual percentages, all of those other grades, okay? So let's 
go through with this exercise and see see what we can do. What is this decision based on? Oh, well, the poster is saying, and this is not uncommon, the nice big headline says conservative candidate is in the lead. Well, in the sample, they're in the lead, right? In the sample, they have 54 and a third percent of, of the support. But is that representative of the population? Is it fair and accurate? No, it's not fair. That's just a point estimate, right? That's just one sample. If we took a different sample, we'd get a different number. Every sample we took, we'd get a different number. Every time I sampled 175 people, I'd get a different number. So no, it's not fair. It's not accurate. That's just that one point estimate. The whole purpose of hypothesis testing is to determine whether or not that sample is sufficiently representative of the population. So let's look at our problem. Here we're going to have, we need to formulate our test. So just like every other test, we need a null and, all, and uh, an alternative hypothesis. Now we're dealing with proportions. So I'm not going to write mu because mu represents an unknown population mean. Now we're testing a proportion. And I always give my students a hard time about this. Notation matters. This means average. If you write average when you should be writing proportion, you lose a mark, at least half a mark, for that incorrect test formulation. So here we're looking at a proportion, so I'm writing P, that's my symbol for proportion. And our hypothesized value is a little bit tricky to find because I don't see it as a number. But I see here they're arguing that this, the candidate has support for more than half. Well, what is half as a number? Well, that's 50%. I'm gonna write it as a decimal. You can write it as a percentage as well if you want, that's perfectly fine. I leave it as a decimal just because then it's a little more consistent with how it's gonna show up in the calculations later on. So the claim is that it is more than half, so the alternative supports that. The null, no, it is not more than half. Okay, so there's our null and alternative hypotheses. The rest of this is extremely familiar, but the formulas are a little bit different. First of all, when we're working with proportions, we will always use the z-distribution because the sample size requirements to achieve the z-distribution are relatively small. When we were working with sample means, remember when we looked at the t-distribution and we looked right down at the very bottom row of the t-distribution, as your sample size grows, the t-distribution very, very, very closely, almost identically resembles the standard normal distribution. The same is true when we're working with proportions. When our sample sizes and when the, the hypothesized proportion are sufficiently large. For the sake of these exercises, we will always assume that those requirements are met. So for any test on proportions, I'm always going to use the Z distribution. Now, the test statistic is similar but different. The test statistics you've seen in the past would look like this, right? It's that point estimate divided by the standard error, which I could just write the standard error something like this, right? For a test on proportions, it's the point estimate minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error. With this notation, they look almost the same. But the standard error here is calculated a little bit differently. The standard error here is going to be P0, 1 minus P0 over N. And I want to make this really clear that all of that is in the square root. So there's our test statistic for this uh, test on proportions. I want to point out one important little detail. 
that in that denominator, I'm using the hypothesized value. I'm not using the sample. I'm not using the point estimate. I'm using the hypothesized value. And again, this comes from the assumption that has followed us throughout all of the tests that we've done, that the null hypothesis is true until or unless we have evidence to show otherwise. And so here in these calculations, I, that, that assumption is implied. I'm using that value when I'm calculating my standard errors. Okay, so now it's just a matter of putting our numbers in. Uh, here's that sample proportion. And again, I'm going to put this in as a decimal just because, as you can see right here, it has to go in as a decimal. Because if I said 1 minus 50, 50%, 50 well, then I'm going to be taking the square root of a negative number, and that's going to cause us some problems. So here I'll put minus 50, 50, and our sample size here, that was 175. So my test statistic, 0.529, oops, 0.529 minus 0.5 divided by, oops, 0.5 divided by 175. So here I have my test statistic 1.14. Now it's all the same. It's all the same as other tests that we've done. We have some level of significance. Alpha is 05. Didn't give it to us. So that's what we'll assume. I'm going to go down to my Z tables now. Z distribution again is perfectly symmetric. I'm going to take advantage of that symmetry and I'm looking for my test statistic of, I forgot what it was already, 1.14. 1. 1. And here we go, 1.14. 1. And so that gives me my probability of call it point 0.13. So there's my p-value, 0.13. Again, I'm taking advantage of the symmetry, right? Because that told me what I just looked up was negative 1.14. That told me that area to the left of it was point 0.13. Here I am doing an upper tail test. My test statistic is actually positive 114. The distribution is perfectly symmetric. So this area is 0.13. Okay. We can use our critical value approach as well. And it's a familiar number. If we're using alpha as 05, then I'm looking for um, 0 0.025 in my table. And I see that right here. So that's 1.96 as my critical value. And so here's this 1.96 right here. 1.96, that defines my rejection space. My test statistic is in the do not reject space. And of course, my p-value is much larger than my level of significance. This all leads us to not reject that null hypothesis. We have insufficient evidence to show that this conservative candidate's lead is statistically significant. So this pollster is selling advertising space. They've got a nice headline conservative candidate is in the lead, gets things all exciting. But no, that lead is not statistically significant. We're unable to show that they have more than 50% of the support of registered voters. Okay, good. That's it. Thanks for watching. We'll do a few more of these. Take care.